Very few people really care about freedom, about the truth. Very few people have guts, the kind of guts on which a real democracy has to depend. Without people with that sort of guts, a free society dies. Doris Lessing was a formidable woman. Born in Africa, she arrived in Britain aged 30 in 1949 with her first book in her bag. She's been passionately engaged with many of the social and political struggles of the 20th century. Prolific, prescient, she became one of the most influential female writers of her time. One of Britain's greatest novelists, Doris Lessing, has died at the age of 94. A winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, she wrote more than 60 books over six decades. Yesterday morning, with a frost. Imagine revisits an extraordinary encounter with Doris Lessing in 2008. Look at it now, it's come to life. It was her last appearance on film. In celebration of her life and work, Imagine presents Doris Lessing, the reluctant heroine. Nobelpriset i litteratur tilldelas den engelska författaren Doris Lessing. Doris Lessing and her invalid son Peter are just back from the shops. They find newsmen on their doorstep. So have you heard the news? Yeah. You've won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Yeah, sure. Does it mean anything to win a prize? I mean, obviously, you don't write Look, books to win a I've prize. I've won all the prizes in Europe, every bloody one. So I'm delighted to win them all. It's a sort of a whole, a whole lot, OK? It's a, it's a royal flush, OK? I'll be back in one minute. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you. You often talk about having to put on a public face. You call it the hostess, don't you? The time I discovered about the hostess very clearly was when I took mescaline once and two people were there to monitor me, make sure I wasn't going to jump out of the window. But I wish they'd left me alone because I would have been able to understand more. As it was, I simply presented the experience to, to them all the time. I simply talked. And I should have been left in peace. But what, so there was the hostess. I now recognise when she walks on stage. I'm going to have to think of nice things to say any minute. You're quite a private person, aren't you? But all of a sudden, you're being inundated with people like me, and lots of demands are being made on you, and uh, your new book's about to be published, yes. and all that. Uh, dear me, you've, you've made a habit of abusing your interviewers. Really, have I done it so much? Now, well, the trouble is you usually ask the same question and then you, you have to take a pride in the fact that you're answering the same question in a different way. However, anyway, let's go on. You haven't answered, asked any stupid questions as far as I can see. The catastrophes and dilemmas of individuals, the failures of individuals, reflect the collapse of the society around them. Is this your view of, of our society? Yes. I think we are living in a collapsing society. I think it's probably got about 10 years to go. Some very precarious patterns of civilization we've set up are going to dissolve. Which is why I feel all the time unreal. Do you imagine yourself being a very old woman, growing old? I don't think we're going to live to be very old. I don't think it matters very much, you understand.
Doris Lessing has to put up with the fact that she is now officially a national treasure and an international celebrity. But this is not some grand, comfortable old lady writer. She is too alarming, too radical and strange for that. Writing literature comes out of a man or a woman sitting alone in a room with a telephone off the hook, probably with a cup of coffee and in the good old days a cigarette. But the writer has become more and more of a personality. Here I sit. Don't imagine that what you're looking at has anything to do with a person who writes anything, but it hasn't. If the person who is sitting here has nothing to do with the person who writes the books, what is that person like, the person who writes the books? Oh, believe me, that's not... It's not... um, Why should I talk about it? It's silent. (laughs) It's quiet. Last week at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, there were people clamouring at the door to get in. So there was a sense that this is a living literary legend and you'd better come and see her now. Come in and come and see her door. We're being ushered towards Doris. Shake the hand of the noble laureate somewhere. Yes. It's the most beautiful dress. Tell me about it. We've, we've just met, haven't we? I hear you were pretty feisty, actually, that's what I was told. She's not a good word, yes. Yes. I hear she was good. Very good. Sounds terrible. My son Peter said, it's very strange, he said. Here you are, me writing away, writing away. And suddenly people notice you. Now what? This is, this is the thing in a nutshell, isn't it? Can I just ask you one last thing? You you wrote in your, your Nobel acceptance you speech. Be doing interviews. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Were you very surprised about this? Um, yes, I was, because I was told a long time ago by someone on the committee, we don't like you, you know, you'll never get it. <laughs> so I never thought about it that they on. So it was a surprise. And did you have to go to Stockholm? And did you have to be? No, you couldn't. Yes. So you got it in the post? Did it I come didn't get it tonight. Oh, they're going to give it to you tonight. Is that what this is for? No, so have you met... I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome the ambassador of Sweden, who is going to present Doris with the Nobel insignia. Dear Doris Lessing, your life work and your great pioneering effort are today not fulfilled, but crowned with a prize you have long deserved. The Swedish Academy sends you its warmest congratulations. I have the great honor of presenting the 2007 Nobel Prize in Literature to Doris Lessing. There isn't anywhere to go from here, is there? Unless I could get a pat on the head from the Pope. (laughs) Perhaps. Alternatively, my favourite fantasy, there I am at the gate of heaven, and there's St Peter jingling his nasty keys, and he's saying to you, Doris, you know that you're there simply because you are standing in for all the other writers who work so hard and who don't get prizes. Yes, sir, is my fantasy, of course. From what he says, you understand that heaven approves of all the things we like. Democracy, proportional representation, fairness, (laughs) kindness. All this, you see, is not just... No, we we are approved of by heaven. Now, just a minute, I'm hearing another voice. What is it? It's daddy. It's my father, and he's saying, you're getting a bit above yourself, my girl. We don't like it. (laughs) Yes, Daddy, I heard. Honestly, I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, you'd better listen, hadn't you? Okay. Thank you. Now I have to... Now 88... 
Doris is still haunted by voices from her childhood. She's always retelling her own story. This is from Doris's autobiography, Under My Skin. Our old friend, the truth. How much of it to tell? How little? It seems it is agreed that this is the first problem of the self-chronicler. The older I get, the more secrets I have, never to be revealed. And why all this emphasis on kissing and telling? Kisses are the least of it. Doris was born in Persia just after the First World War, but she lived in southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, until she came to London 60 years ago. Have you always lived in this area? Did you come to North? I have for the last 30 years. Yeah. I had a house in the, wait, what's it called? It happens all the time. I know, it happens to me too. North London? Yes, it was down near um, Summerstown. Right. That's where it was. But they, they soon had I bought it and done it up, and they compulsorily purchased it. So, um... <laughs> Sounds very Mugabe-like. <laughs> exactly. Do you sort of get nostalgic still for, for Africa? I get nostalgic for the bush. Mm. For the but belt? Most of that's gone anyway. I mean, what I was brought up with is gone completely. Now, I just wanted to show you these pictures of the house going up. Can you imagine the bliss for us? You see, the, these are the poles of the walls going in. That's the stage of the thatch. And we were playing in this. I still remember it vividly. And then it turned into that. There you are with your brother, is that right? I think so. Dogs must be around. <laughs> My room was the third down from the top or end of the house, and it was very big and very light, for it had a large low window and a door which I kept propped open with a stone so that I could look down on the hawks that hung over the fields and watch them turn and slide down the currents of air with their stretched wings motionless. The big field below the house was a mealy field, the ploughshare cutting smooth through the hard soil left a clean, shining surface, iridescent, as if it had been oiled with dark oil. And sometimes, from the height of the house, looking down, these clean, shared surfaces caught the sun all over the field at the same moment, so that a hundred acres of clods glittered darkly together, flashing off a sullen light. And at such times, the hawks swerved off, high, and away, frightened. I, I love that passage. It makes me think of the, the size of the world that Doris grew up in. Um, and I think being allowed to roam free with her brother, being in such a great space, that may have given her both independence of mind and a sense that she can look into the distance, that she can see us small and she can see what sense we make in those great spaces. How much is Africa still part of her, do you think? It's absolutely her soul. It's not particularly a love of Africans as such, uh, certainly not of the white Africans, um, but it's about the place. She writes, and she's a, a nature writer, she's rather actually underestimated. She writes absolutely wonderfully about that. The natives are loading up sacks of maize to be marketed in Europe. And there goes a bullock. The mealy train plunges down a cutting. So your father's dream was to make a fortune out of maize, and he arrives here in 1924. This was meant to be up for four years as I was. And how long did you spend in it? Oh, my God, about 20. <laughs> <laughs> so the dream didn't really come true, did it? Put it mildly, it didn't come true. I mean, the whole thing was surreal. My mother put down very smart, black, glossy linoleum from one end of the house to the other. But as the wood 
uh, decayed, they subsided, so there were lumps and hollows everywhere, and suddenly a shoot would come up from a linoleum, and then you'd cut it down, but it came up again. It was weird. The spiders were my misery, and just awful. But the little bush monkeys used to play around in the rafters. And can you imagine the bliss for a child? I was nine years old then. I yeah, miss these dogs terribly. I suppose it's gone long ago, the house. Burnt it, went in a fire. The whole thing went. It was a paradise which now only exists in the game park. Look what's arrived here. There's your cat. That cat could easily bite. She's not a sweet little pussy. No, I didn't think she would be. And now you have your garden, Doris, out there. Yes, well, I used to do it all myself, but not anymore, alas. Well, never mind. Doris writes, every writer has a myth country. My myth, the bush I was brought up in. The old house built of earth and grass, the animals, the birds. Myth does not mean something untrue, but a concentration of truth. Yesterday morning, with a frost, this calendula was flat like a little bit of old rag. Look at it now, it's come to life. Rather mysterious, that garden. Those steps at the bottom, God knows where they go. Where do they go? They go up to the end where a place where we feed birds. A lot of birds get fed up there. And over the fence is a reservoir. They want to build on it. And the entire neighborhood is fighting them with committees and lawyers and God knows what. Because all the animals would go hedgehogs, foxes, birds, they'd all go. So the that's why we're fighting now. It's too cold out there. Nature has always been bliss for Doris, but family life never. No, oh dear, oh dear. Listen, I know it's here because I put it out this morning. That's me and my mother. Look at this smiling, happy girl. We were engaged in bitter warfare all the time. She was always heavily made up with thick powder and this terrible dying duck look. This is how she saw herself. And of course, it's how she felt herself, for one. You think that's because she was so disappointed in her life that she yes. wanted to live her life through you? Well, of course, yes. She absolutely grabbed you. Her survival depended on me being her. This, this focus on you, it was utterly intolerable. And that's why I always feel terrible when the government comes up with some idea about returning women to their kitchens. These sick, terrible women who should have been working. They were perfectly clever women. What were they doing sitting at home, driving their children mad? She was really a misery. When she went to bed for a year, I think she decided she could not stand the life, and I can see from her point of view, why not? Basically, she thinks her parents should never have married. That, she says wryly, would have saved a lot of unpleasantness. So, in her new book, she gives her father a different wife. I enjoyed giving him someone warm and loving, she writes. And in this reality, the First World War never happens. These two had a terrible time because of the First World War. So I've given them a life, an ordinary kind of conventional sort of life. This is your father, isn't it? He missed Passchendaele because his leg was shot off. You see that wooden leg now in the museums. There they had a couple of cases full of ancient wooden legs. And there I saw my father's leg. The, this amazing picture of uh, your mother tending your father. There's a sort of real romance to this. You'd look at this picture and you'd think this was a happy movie about a, you know, sort of the nurse and the patient. And you know, it took me a part. long time to think this, but you know that women didn't get any husbands. I don't, people have forgotten. 
There were no men, they were all killed in the trenches. And they thought, hang on, well, one woman got a husband, it was my mother. Why? Well, she was nursing him in hospital. She just would not do what her father wanted, because she was her father's uh, brilliant daughter. But you see, I know now what he wanted her to be him. And she said no and went off to be a nurse. I wonder whether any of that was inherited. <laughs> well... The stubbornness, difficultness. Yes, he shouted, you may no longer consider yourself my daughter, and slammed the door. I mean, it's like out of a bad novel. I've given her opportunities to use her incredible um, talents. I mean, we all used to joke and say that she ought to be running a cabinet in England. But you've given her no children, Doris. Left to herself, she probably wouldn't have children. I don't think so. I, she wasn't, um, uh, what is the word? She wasn't a very loving, that, that's a silly word. I don't think she would have missed children if she didn't have them. Oh, now this is the one that's important. That's my father, me and my brother. And here is his wooden leg. I like that picture because everybody looks jolly. My mother is not jolly in any of her pictures. I sense also that there must have been a bond with you and your father, of course, oh, which yes, is... yes, very much so. He was very keen on my brother and I being allowed to stay up indefinitely and look at the stars. You see, he was that kind of father. Doris says... I think my biggest influence was sitting outside our house, looking at the stars. You automatically start thinking in terms of millions of years if you take that point of view. Well, my father would say, if we blow ourselves up, there's plenty more where we came from. She talks about sitting outside the house in Africa and looking up at the sky. It was on one of those nights that she started reading a book called The Star Maker by Olaf Stapleton. It is the most extraordinary book about a man's soul who ventures out into the universe and comes upon the Star Maker. And the Star Maker is cold and indifferent. And he's about to put our universe, which he regards as a failure, onto a shelf and start with a new and better universe. Most novelists put their characters right in the centre of the world, and the world isn't much bigger than them. And what Doris does is pull back. In Mara and Dan, she's talking about tens of thousands of years in the future. And so I think people feel little. They get a kind of metaphysical ache because aren't they important then? And I think she tells us, we're very interesting, but not very important. And maybe that makes people feel a chill. So her father gave her the stars, which would inspire her science fiction. But she now recognises that she did get something from her mother too, her love of books. This woman used to be telling us stories every night, for hours. She ordered books all the way from England. I remember so clearly what it meant to me when these great parcels of books arrived. What a thrill. And the books were so exciting. I can't imagine my childhood without them. I owe everything to her. I was never educated, you see. Without the books, I'd have come to grief. She doesn't really think like other people. And this means that the, her stories don't go in the direction that we think. Um, and I would think this might have something to do with the fact that she didn't have a university education. Though Doris dropped out of school for good at 14, she was devouring the great works of literature, which would help her find her place in the tradition of European realism. The books that she admires, the Russians, Proust, Thomas Mann, whom she says is the last philosophical novelist. But it's not true. I think she's the last one. Of course, she's a great admirer of Tolstoy, whom she quotes, the function of art is to make that understood which in the form of argument would be incomprehensible. I quite agree with that. I mean, it isn't just the pill being 
in a nice spoonful of sugar. It is actually that you understand things through people's lives that you don't understand just through arguing. She can pierce the heart. She can deal with big themes, but she can do it in a way that is true to us. True to emotion as well as to intellect. Doris always said it was great literature that led her to reject the society around her. She fled to the capital, Salisbury, now Harare, leaving her parents and her childhood behind, though she would always be haunted by them. I don't think I've ever read anything by anybody who so much needed to leave their parents. And she clearly never did solve her relationship to her mother, but um, it's a long battle. You say that Alfred and Emily is going to be your last book, is it? I think so. I get less and less time for writing, because my son is an invalid, so by the time I fed him and taken him to the uh, doctors and all this kind of thing, I might get half an hour on one day and three-quarters of an hour on another to do any work. The last book it was so difficult writing, and I thought, is anything worth it, this struggle? I, I wouldn't believe Doris, although it may be true. I wouldn't believe that she's not going to write another novel. I think... I think it's her nature. The son Doris cares for now is from her second marriage to a German communist called Gottfried Lessing. They married during World War II. He was um, an enemy alien, which, as you can well imagine, it wasn't very nice for my parents. I couldn't have done anything more annoying, really. But even more shocking at the time had been leaving her first two children when she divorced her first husband. You leave your babies. What made you I leave your to. babies? Now, look, I've written about this at length, you know, and I'm... Um, OK, I'll just... Yes, we will, we, will, we will quote from that, but I'm, as you're here, and I'm here. I left the, the family because I couldn't stand that life, that white life in southern Rhodesia. It was horrible. It was uh, sundowner parties and tea parties with the women. That was my life. And um, I left. I had to leave that because if I didn't, I would have been an alcoholic inside 10 years, as I know, or have a breakdown like my mother, who was living a life she couldn't bear. So I was right to leave. But I don't know what... Well, I know what my uh, kids would say about that. I mean, they say, well, we understand why you left, but that's my son John... But it doesn't mean to say I forgive you for it, it says, quite cheerfully. So, um, and there's my daughter, Jean, in Cape Town with her two granddaughters, my two granddaughters. So, in the long run, it's turned out all right. Doris wrote, I had switched off. I was protecting myself because I knew I was going to commit the unforgivable and leave two small children. I explained to them that they would understand later why I had left. I was going to change this ugly world. They would live in a beautiful and perfect world where there would be no race hatred, injustice and so forth. More important, I carried like a defective gene a kind of doom or fatality which would trap them as it had me if I stayed. Leaving, I would break some ancient chain of repetition. One day, they would thank me for it. I was absolutely sincere. There isn't much to be said for sincerity in itself. Doris had found a less conventional kind of family, people who shared her radical ideas, the communists. It was like coming home, meeting the communists. You know, to talk about books that you'd read. Most of the Deans had not read anything more than General's memoirs. <laughs> what bliss it was not to have to shut up. Because you couldn't possibly say in ordinary uh, Rhodesian society that the system was not going to last. It was going to come to an end and quite soon. But there I was with the Reds who understood exactly what I was saying. Her first novel was an exploration of the tensions of the racist society in which she'd been brought up. 
When it was published in 1950, it was an instant success in Europe and the USA. James Baldwin's comment on this was, it's a book and a half. That woman is a writing motherfucker. <laughs> and that's quite something when you were just well, out of your teens. And your <laughs> first book. I mean, it's just amazing, isn't it? And this is from The Grass is Singing. She watched the natives, swinging the sandbot from her wrist so that it made snaky patterns in the red dust. Suddenly she noticed that one of the boys was not working. Then she said, get back to work. He looked at her with the expression common to African labourers, a blank look, as if he hardly saw her, as if there was an obsequious surface with which he faced her and her kind, covering an invulnerable and secret hinterland. I said, get back to work. She could hear the other natives laughing a little from where they stood on the mealy dump. Their laughter, which was good-humoured, drove her suddenly mad with anger. She thought it was aimed at her. This man was shrugging and smiling and turning his eyes up to heaven as if protesting that she'd forbidden him to speak his own language and then hers. So what was he to speak? <laughs> Doris's mission is to enable people to speak and to read, to make great literature available here in Britain and in Africa. It's as vivid for her today as it ever was. And somewhere in my mind, just behind my shoulder, is this black girl who has to walk four miles to get a little bit of water. For some reason or other, I identify with that girl. There she is, pregnant, and there's a dust storm, as there so often is, with two little children. She has no hope whatsoever, because a kindly lover is not going to arrive after the sunset and rescue her. Yet she's a clever girl. She has no future. And I think of them. I do. You see, I see myself reflected when I go to Africa. Please give us a book. Please send us books. I mean, it's enough to break your heart, really. In a lecture Doris wrote on winning the Nobel Prize, she laments that in Africa people are desperate to read, even if they haven't eaten for days, while in the West the Internet rules and we read less and less. But many people here feel excluded from literature. In Liverpool, there's a project which takes books to places where they would not usually be read and reads them aloud in a group. It was inspired by Doris Lessing. I wrote to her after reading Shikasta. It had the most astonishing effect on me. I just thought, that's it now, everything's different. I don't know how I can leave the house tomorrow. And um, that was really frightening, and I felt very angry with her for having written a book that... Affected you so ..took much. everything away. Mm. So I wrote this letter saying, why have you done this to me? And she wrote back, and I have the letter. When it fell through my door, I opened it up. I couldn't believe it was a reply. And um, she says, I am not a teacher. Um, it's very important you understand this. And then she, she tells me to read, read more books. If you cannot get them or cannot f afford them, I know they're expensive, as all books are now, I'll send you some. If you can afford them, so much the better. I like the bit at the end. If you travel with us, you'll have to learn things you do not want to learn in ways you do not want to learn them. <laughs> It was like an electric current, and Jane wanted to pass it on. So she started the reading groups, which some of these people will be running. To go and read Martha Quest by Doris Lessing in the locked ward of a, a mental health trust, or to read Tobias Wolfe's This Boy's Life in YMCA with Homeless Men. 
it's an interesting project and, and a lot can happen. What she had been waiting for, like a revelation, was a pain, not a happiness. There was a slow integration during which she and the little animals and the moving grasses and the sun-warmed trees and the slopes of shivering silvery mealies and the great dome of blue light overhead and the stones of earth underneath her feet became one. She understood quite finally her smallness, the unimportance of humanity. Okay. Could, could, you, could you offer that to people at Asylum Link? Yeah. Would people recognise the experience? Yeah, I think it's something that's outside of like all the social constructs in the world. It's, it's just you and, mm. and the rest of the universe. Yeah. Um, and I, I can imagine anyone having those thoughts. Adolescence is the first time that perhaps you let your mind wander into these dark places sometimes and you think about things more deeply than you have done as a child. But I think it can happen throughout life. For that moment, while well, space and time, but these are words, and if she understood anything, it was that words here were like the sound of a baby crying in a whirlwind. It's always seemed strange that someone who started off adult life as an active communist is also so mystically inclined. She is today, and she clearly was way back then as Martha Quest, starting out on her quest as a teenager in the bush. Hers has been an incredible journey, but always with the same drive to find meaning in existence. In 1949, with her third child, Peter, but without his father, Doris left Africa for England. The war still lingered in people's minds and behavior, she wrote. There was a wariness, a weariness. Single mother, suddenly successful first novelist, she always felt an outsider. She came into a complicated society that is English intellectual life and English class structures and all that. And she takes pleasure in saying, of course, I come from outside, I stand outside, I can see from an angle that you can't see because you were born in it. And it's very useful to her, both really and as a pose. Doris, I were here. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm distraught with too much of everything, that's what I am. Oh, and too us. Too much of everything. All right, sorry about that. Doris still lives a little like an outsider today, despite her success worldwide. Right, Doris, that's yours. Oh, thank you. See, I took oh, care. great. What's the name of the cat, by the way? Yum Yum. It is because. I thought it'd be funny to call a portly middle-aged cat the name of that ravishing princess in the Mikado. Yes. But right. most people don't see the joke. Well, she's yum-yum in the sense that she looks like she's got an appetite. <laughs> <laughs> I look back. I was so raw and so green when I came. I trusted everybody and did the most amazingly stupid thing. However... Tell me about the stupid things. Well, there was one, um, Spiv was the name for them then, who made a, a beeline for me because he knew a fool when he saw one. He adored telling me some ghastly story. I believed half of it because it was always interesting, this Spiv. He also got money out of me. I don't know how he did it. There's something in me. You know, that open palm, I can't resist dropping coins into it. It was this green, charitable 30-year-old 
who joined the British Communist Party, just as the Cold War was really kicking in. It was a time for apocalyptic thinking. We honestly believed the whole world would become communist and we would become free and noble and there would be no um, sex problems, there would be no um, poverty. You wouldn't... Did you honestly believe that? Yeah, I certainly did. I believed it for a short time. We all did. I don't know how things were for you in the 50s, but I think many people on the left would have said that it was an incredible time because everything was exploding. It was beginning to dawn on the comrades that what they were saying about the Soviet Union was not true. I was surrounded by people having breakdowns or getting religion or something. Everyone was in turmoil. Now, some of those men were passionate communists, and suddenly their hearts were broken. It was dreadful to see it, you know, because for them it, it meant the end of everything that they'd ever cared about. Could you ever have imagined then a world in which communism is just a distant memory? Does that sadden you? It doesn't sadden me. I think it, capitalism makes a much better job than communism do, <laughs> did. But we believe this rubbish, absolutely, totally. But I think there's something about politics that makes people mad, really. This is where Doris often used to sit and write. Her political experiences fed straight into her fiction. I don't know if you've ever been on the left or not, but if you have, you will remember the language, the jargon. Pompous, awful language. You talk about that hospital for rhetorical disease. Yeah. You know, that <laughs> <laughs> really, she's a joiner and a non-joiner. She embarks and then she disembarks, doesn't she? Well, I don't know, Alan, but you know, you, you hate being labelled. She has spurts of enthusiasm for something that, if she joined it, it might improve the world an inch at a time. But when she finds it just makes it worse, she gives up, goes elsewhere. She gets into prisons because Doris Lessing is a joiner. She walks on the marches, she joins the Communist Party, she glowers at the Communist Party from within, she leaves the Communist Party, she analyses that prison and off she goes and finds another group to join. When she came to Britain, everybody was very frightened of the atom bomb. That fear hung over us all in the 50s and early 60s. And she was absolutely a part of that, and that's, that per permeates a lot of her early work. What we created was so extraordinary. The Aldermaster and Marches, do you remember them? Yes. They were packed out with every conceivable kind of person, from architects and members of parliament and poets. People have forgotten about all that. Doris Lessing, novelist and journalist and a sponsor of the March on Aldermaston, will be questioning the Home Secretary, Mr Butler. You know, I think a great many people are not so much worried about whether your government or the Russians or the Americans are going to start a war, but whether some trigger-happy general might start one by accident. Now, the possible future president of the United States only four years ago was talking about using an atom bomb, just quite casually, a conventional weapon. What guarantee is there that another um, slightly off-balance general might precipitate the whole world into war? She has the passion to get into the event, which a lot of people who, with a passion for words, don't have. But the little voice that's watching starts almost immediately. If her character is going fervently on a march against nuclear war, nevertheless, she says most of the people are here because they like being in a group and they are having a nice party and they will have a nice party all the way to Aldermaston. She'd become a spokesperson for what she believed in. But she increasingly felt that wasn't what a writer should be. 
The writer isn't the 39 Articles or the Communist Manifesto. The writer is a machine for exploring experience. That's what writers do. I mean, we, we plunge into experience and come up with rubbish or pearls, as the case may be. But you don't expect, expect what comes up to be um, something to be quoted. Ah, she says... No, no, I know, agree with you entirely. She plunged into the political, sexual and emotional turmoil of the 50s, becoming what she called a free woman. Her mother's arrival on the scene had thrown her into crisis. A friend said she should go to a therapist or I would not survive. She was right. I was so desperate I went. I think it saved me, she wrote. She came up with what would be her most groundbreaking book, Sex. The difficulty of writing about sex for women is that sex is best when not thought about, not analysed. They get irritable when men talk technically, it's out of self-preservation. They want to preserve the spontaneous emotion that is essential for their satisfaction. There's always a point, even with the most perceptive and intelligent man, when a woman looks at him across a gulf he hasn't understood. I wrote it fast, because I was so involved in it all. And what it has got is that it's got a charge, and that is simply because of what was going on then. It was published well before the women's liberation movement, but it's often taken to be a specifically feminist book, much to Doris's annoyance. I was writing about fragmentation. The second line in that book is... As far as I can see, everything is falling apart. And that is what I thought the Golden Notebook was about. This is not what the feminists thought. To this day, I'm interested why did they find it so extraordinary, the Golden Notebook? Because all I was writing was what anyone could hear all the time. Reading the Golden Notebook, women became conscious of the way they talked with each other or reflected on the way they talked with each other, which she represented so beautifully and so well. I first read The Golden Notebook in 1972 and it was around the time that we were starting Spare Rib magazine. All through the novel, in fact, the theme is division, divisions of class and gender and race and nationality. It's by going to something deeper than those categories that you can transcend what you've been born with, your identities that you've grown up with. They all fall away, but you actually have a bigger and fuller identity after that. I thought it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever read about the novel. She decided that if the world was fragmented, she would create a fragmented form. So all these endless overlapping narratives, and each of them in a different idiom, in a different style. Yes, and each of them, of course, she's saying she can't connect it, but actually she has connected it. Um, it's connected by being there between the covers. He says, poor bastard, he's got the prick the size of a needle. Julia, I always thought she didn't love him. Bob, thinking she hasn't heard. No, it's always worried him stiff, he's just got a small one. Julia, but she never did love him. Anyone could see that just by looking at them together. Bob, a bit impatient now. It's not their fault, poor idiots. Nature was against the whole thing from the start. Julia. Of course it's her fault. She should never have married him if she didn't love him. Bob, irritated because of her stupidity, begins a long technical explanation while she looks at me, sighs, smiles and shrugs. You could never mistake Doris's view of women for that of Jane Austen, or indeed George Eliot, or indeed Daphne du Maurier. She writes with a wonderfully acute sense of reality here. This made her a truly modern writer. Thank you. Nobody had described women's lives like this before. In spite of her own doubts, um, her legacy is partly, is partly feminist. When you go anywhere with Doris, women come up to her and say, Mrs Lessing, I, you've never met me, you don't know who I am, but you've changed my life. Thank you very much. Pleasure to meet you. And it changed her life too. When I wrote 
remembered the golden notebook. Um, all kinds of extraordinary things happened to me which didn't fit into any of my philosophies, put it mildly. Now, I could either have said, oh, they didn't happen, which is what I think a lot of people do, or I could have said, I am nuts, or I could have looked for answers. You are now in an area where you talk about extrasensory perception, where you talk about psychic communities, the possibility of communicating with people from the future to the past and so on, completely different area uh, you're, you're, you're going into, away from the old confident rationalism. You still believe in telepathy and any of those things? Are those yes. Things? Where did that understanding come from? Well, it's experience. I mean, there's, we all experience this, haven't we? I mean, all kinds of things go on that are not permitted in our philosophies. We live with them and use them, some of us. We don't have to be quite as hidebound. When I say we, I mean human race. You don't have to be as hidebound as we are. Is this connected with your involvement with Sufism? It's a kind of Eastern mysticism, isn't it? You know, I don't want to talk about Sufism. OK. Um, because, um, you know, I have been involved in it for 30-odd years now. I'm afraid of distorting the thing, which is very easy to do. One of the characters says in the Golden Notebook, I despise people who don't experiment with their lives. This is very brave. You know, how far is any of us prepared to experiment with our lives? She experiments emotionally all the time. I suspect that if you had a graph of Doris's emotional life, it would be up and down like the Alps. Clearly, the notion of madness and psychological breakdown. Those are very important themes in all those books that you're writing in the 60s and 70s, from the Golden Notebook onwards. I've always been, for some reason, involved with people who were depressives or something. I don't know why that is. I've, I've thought that probably it's a way of me keeping at a distance from lunacy, because I'm always involved in dealing with someone else who's a lunatic. It's not something I'd have chosen. It's something I've had to do. In one novel, Doris writes, she sat thinking so intensely that the house around her vanished. The floorboards were giving way. Houses, buildings, streets blown away, going, gone, an illusion. And she talks of sleep, that other country. You dreamt a lot. <laughs> all my life, all my life, um, as a, I rely, I've always relied on my dreams, and more and more now, because I use it a great deal for my work, and um, I know other writers do, but sometimes they don't say so, because that makes you sound a bit loopy. But I'm too old to care about whether I'm called loopy or not. Mara and Dan, I was dreaming the whole first third of that book, every night, I would know what I was going to write the next day. I don't know what I would do without dreaming. This draws us into another area, really, which is your decision to start to write science fiction or space fiction. Start to write. I had written The Memoirs of the Survivor and Briefing for Descent into Hell, which are not realistic. And then when I uh, went into the Shikasta series, it was because you cannot write about millions of years, beginning, Fred Blogg sat at the kitchen table drinking a cup of Typhoo tea. You have oh, to do it differently. She loved all those covers where in, in the back there was a needle-like rocket ship and in front there was a stunning blonde. Her sort of mischief... It appealed to her to write science fiction, didn't it, really, in a way, to be part of this looked-down-upon group? Yes, but such is science fiction. It's exclusion from the literary establishment that the chaps are naturally paranoid, and so many of them protested violently. Who's this woman writing ordinary novels, invading our territory? So she got a warm reception from your colleagues in the science fiction world, then? A bit chillsome. But then I persuaded her to come with me and be guest of honour in Florida at the International Conference for the Fantastic in the Arts. So the ladies from all over the USA came to see Doris. It was extraordinary. 
and Doris would sit there by the pool chatting to these people. Never again was there such a large attendance at the Conference of the Fantastic, even when we had Stephen King. So how do you rate Doris as a science fiction writer? The novels are oddly handmade and indeed homemade. I find that an endearing quality. But, uh, well, she got away with it, didn't she? She got the Nobel Prize. The stars, the vast spaces that Doris got from Africa and from her father, have continued to feed into science fiction and fables, analogies for our world and all its ills. In the 80s and 90s, Doris collaborated with Philip Glass on operas based on her science fiction series. They expressed her fears for the future of humanity. She does seem to have a speeded up sense of time. And that leads us to her other great theme, which is really the death of civilizations. And that's really come through in the later work. Of course, this is great storytelling. This is epic storytelling. But it's also about our future as a species. What's your sense of where the world is going? You thought you weren't even going to be alive by this yes. point in your life. Are you a pessimist? Well, it depends how you define the word. An optimist is someone who thinks, um, everything is basically all right. It'll be fine, and, and we're not going to have millions of people dying in Africa, and there won't be global warming. Whereas I think a lot of these things are indeed going to happen. We're ruining the oceans, which is the beginning of ruining of everything. I think we're a disastrous, disastrous species. We just destroy everything. But a minority of us will survive whatever catastrophe it was. This, I think, is, op is optimism. It's, um... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a glimpse, anyway. Survival, global and personal. In a way, Alfred and Emily is about surviving her mother. And now, half a century after her death, beginning to realise that they do have things in common. I thought I might tell you about energy, which I've been blessed with. I know this sounds improbable, but more than once I finished a book. There's no reason for me to do anything but enjoy myself. What I do is I go to Shannon in Ireland, book a car, and drive up and down that coast at as much speed as one can get up uh, on those roads. And I've done that not once, but half a dozen times. What? It's this physical energy, and where do I get it from? It's from my mother. She was eaten up by it. I think it's probably why she went crazy. She had too much energy and not enough to use it on. That's what I think, yes. You have to move. And, of course, you have to write. But it, I only thought about it last night. I was thinking about my mother's energy and where did it go to? It went into me because... Um, I used to have it. I haven't got it now, alas. I don't know about that. You once said, one has to accept loneliness. It's a human condition, no matter how many parties or churches we belong to. Do you still feel that way? Yes, well, we're always inside this tower, aren't we? We're not communicating as much as we might do. How have we done? Well, we're very much the same kind of person, you know, so we haven't done that too badly, have we? <laughs> I want to tell you something. This is a little memory. I was on the farm and Night after night, I would stand with honey on my fingertips and moths would fly out of the bush and settle on my hand and drink. 
What a memory. I remember then I used to weep with gratitude. I don't know why. These beautiful things would just come and drink honey off my hand. I mean, nothing like that can ever happen to you again when you've grown up. Thank you.